So hello everyone and welcome to today's IPCNM CPD Building Masterclass. My name is Julie Kennedy and I am your host. Now I am absolutely thrilled personally as well to welcome consultant, nurse practitioner and international speaker Tracy Dennison with us here today. So welcome Tracy. I love reading how passionate you are about holistic patient-centered care and a focus on patient empowerment which I think is exactly what's missing most of the time and I even believe you won an award in 2023 so we're very lucky to have you with us here today I shall first start with some housekeeping. Our call today will be a maximum of one hour, including 15 minutes Q&A. Tracy would like the questions as we go along. The session is recorded, so please mute yourself, but keep your video on so the speaker can see that they're not speaking to themselves and use the chat box for the questions that you may want to ask and suggestions. Now our topic today, I love it, very cleverly thought. I thought the title, how hot are you? (laughs) And why we all need to know about menopause in the workplace. So I'm in I'm in that phase of life. So I am extremely looking forward to this talk. So over to you, Tracy. Oh, thank you, Julie, for that. A wonderful introduction. Lovely to meet you. Um, and good afternoon to anybody who is watching or watching on catch up. And um, this is going to be a very informal session. I do have some structure to it, of course. Um, but there's but um What I'm very keen is that it sort of runs quite organically. If people have questions, ask the questions um, and we can pick things up as as we like. Um, I can see that uh, we've got other people coming to play, haven't we? So I'll just I'll just hang on just for a little minute. So we're talking today about menopause in the workplace, but fundamentally what I have found through my years of looking after people and experiencing the perimenopause and menopause myself is that understanding, underpinning understanding menopause in the workplace, we actually need to understand the menopause itself. And then we can can translate that into what that can look like in a working environment, what the issues can be, how people can be supported. And there's a whole other piece of work there around um, the legal side as well, and what reasonable adjustments employers should make and employees should be able to request. Um, So there's a lot, a lot going on there. Today, we're going to sort of look really at the fundamentals of the menopause itself, a little bit of how that will translate into a working environment. But I'm aware that people watching um, may come from a whole different variety of working environments. They may be solo, um, a solo workforce, uh, in which case it's very much more looking quite inwardly. Um, and seeing what's happening to yourself. But I would challenge anybody watching um, not to know a woman over the age of 40. Uh, And if you don't know a woman or somebody who was gender assigned female at birth over the age of 40, that's fine, switch off right now. (laughs) This isn't for you. But if you know somebody who was female at birth and is over the age of 40 and potentially quite a lot younger, then there is information in here that can support. I am really passionate that we educate everybody about menopause. This is not just for women of a certain age. Uh, This is for everybody because we've all worked or been related to or lived with people who are going through the perimenopause and menopause. Just before we kick off, I'll tell you a little story that we've dubbed window wars over the years. So when I was 15, I actually started work. It was because of when my birthday was, I wasn't a dropout. Um, I I, I was an apprentice um, in an office-based environment before I went into nursing. And um, I worked in an office, one of these big open plan offices, Um, And I worked with this lovely lady who sat on the desk desk next to me. And invariably, I'd get there before she did because I'm a very early person, pathologically early. And I'm always cold. Um, So I was there in the office as I was. She would arrive and the first thing she'd do is throw, throw open all of the windows. Now, I thought... 
this lady lived on a boat, actually. I thought it's because she lives on a boat. She's so used to it being freezing. I'm absolutely frozen. So the minute she would get up to go make a coffee, I'd shut all of the windows. And then the minute I went to the loo, she'd open them all and we had window walls. And it's only now on reflection that I think, actually, this was probably related to her perimenopause or menopause. And had she been aware of that, maybe she was, I don't know, but had we had a more open and inclusive environment where she could set some tracing, I am boiling and I can do nothing about that. Will you stick an extra jumper on? Um, or had I had any understanding at all, we wouldn't have had this constant opening and closing of these poor windows and this window wall situation. And having spoken to so many people over the years, I know I'm not alone in that. And I think window walls probably happens everywhere. <laughs> so on that note, I'm going to start sharing my screen with you. Um, here we go. And so as uh, Julie very kindly introduced me, I'm Tracy Dennison. I'm a consultant nurse practitioner at East Riding Aesthetics in Wellness in Beverly in East Yorkshire over in the UK. Um, and I generally work quite closely with a fabulous therapist colleague called Leslie, well, Leslie Dobson, actually. She is um, a nurse by background also, um, but she left nursing about 20 years ago to go into um, holistic therapies because she found that that was such a personal, useful thing in her life and we are going to be bringing her virtually into this presentation um, a little bit later on. So we're going to have a little look at what the menopause actually is. What do we mean by that? It gets banded around a lot, it's very trendy, um, but do we know what we're actually talking about? We're going to look at just some fundamental things that might be helpful, particularly if people are feeling a little bit overwhelmed and they're symptomatic or they have people around them that are struggling and it's just some little small things that might make a big difference that are within our gift. We're going to look at supplements. Uh, I see so many ladies in my clinic who say no I want to do it all naturally but how? Uh, so we can talk about supplements for a little while and a uh, menopause um, presentation wouldn't be complete without a discussion around HRT as well. Um, so I've got some information uh, around that to share with you as well as various different therapies and options and a nice relaxation at the end. So say do, um, do feel free to ask questions as we go along uh, because often, particularly if it's any ladies of a certain age watching by the time you wait to the end, your question's gone out of your head. So what is menopause itself? So the word itself, it's a combination of menstruation and pause. So it means our periods have stopped, basically. Menopause, we define as once a lady hasn't had a period for a full 12 months. But that's not when it starts. It can start way before then, and it can be very immediate from very uh, various other clinical situations. But generalizing it can start way before then the national guidance for clinical um, health and excellence would tell us it's around about 45 that perimenopause can start um, but for some women that can be earlier and perimenopause that just means peri in medical speak is around so it's around the time of menopause and uh, and that can start by you still have your periods, so people can find it very confusing because they think I can't be menopausal. I'm regular as clockwork with my periods, but it can start with insidious little symptoms creeping in that that you might not realise, and we can often put down to other things. Generally speaking, and I am massively generalising here, I accept, but around the age of forty five an average sort of woman is juggling work, home life, probably children that are just about to hit puberty or are there already. So there could be a lot of potential for banging heads in the house, not physically, just metaphorically. Um, <laughs> but it can all heighten the stress levels and make things quite tricky to navigate. Um, so there can be a lot going on around that time that you might not actually initially identify as 
um, perimenopausal symptoms. The bad news is we're never technically really postmenopausal um, because once your period stops, that's not just it really. Our, our symptoms and our hormones carry on evolving over years and years and years. Um, so, um, you know, I've got patients in their 70s that I am managing for their menopause still. That's not uncommon. And a lot of them come to me and they feel like it's just them. And it, it really isn't. And, and a lot of this is around the fact that if we go back 100, 150 years, women didn't live through their menopause. They died way before then. You know, my, my uh, grandmother that survived the longest, she died early 60s so if she had a menopause let's say she had a menopause at the average age of 52 and died at 63 she just lived 11 years beyond that uh, they it translate that now we'd still be working <laughs> we're never going to retire oh, we'd, we'd, we'd still be working juggling that house maybe still have a mortgage to pay um, you know, possibly because we're having our children later, I still have a family at home. There's lots of things to throw into that mix. Um, so we'd never really post-menopausal. We, we just are in a different phase where our periods have stopped, but hormones continue to change. Um, and like I said in my introduction, anybody who is assigned female at birth will still experience menopause in some form or another. Uh, and we do need to be very mindful of that because our um oh l i've forgotten the all the 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 the, the, the letters this is a menopause brains um but but our um lesbian and trans communities and on all of the 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 other different um gender identifications um if we've got for example women that have transitioned to men it might not be immediately obvious that this is something that they're going through. And if they've been assigned female at birth, they will be experiencing the menopause in some form or another at some time or another. So it's just something to be very mindful of. So I'm gonna go through some menopause symptoms. Bear in mind, there are about 70 common ones. Uh, so I'm not going to go through them all, but maybe some ladies can identify. I'll just put all of these up because um, it irritates me, does all of the slidey slideys. Um, but an irregular uh, menstrual cycle is often one of the first signs that, that sort of trigger women to think, oh, maybe things are going a little bit sideways. Maybe some of these symptoms I've been experiencing are a little bit related to um, menopause. Um, if your cycle starts to become a little bit different and that can be heavier, lighter, more frequent or less frequent. So all, all of the potential um, changes that you can get can happen. There is no, you know, it slowly slows down and then you will stop. For some women it does, for some women it's very different. Hot flushes and night sweats, we regularly associate as one of the top menopause symptoms, don't we? Now, not every woman will experience those. And quite often I see ladies who they say, oh, well, I'm not experiencing hot flushes or night sweats, so I can't be perimenopausal or menopausal. Yes, you can. It's just one of many, many symptoms. Fatigue is very, very common. And one, again, that is often misunderstood because we're juggling work, life, home, children, uh, all the rest of it, our stressful, busy lives. And we can get tired and you can rationalise that, can't you? But sometimes it's as a result of our changing hormones. Lapses in memory and loss of concentration can be one of the biggest things. And this is where I get ladies in my clinic and they are frightened. They are really scared because they feel as though they've maybe got something like early onset dementia um, or very scary things going on. And if they've got uh, diagnoses like that already in their family that can be a terrifying time and they may not necessarily sort of reconcile to the fact that, that these memory problems can be related to our dropping in estrogen levels rather than something more organic um, that like, like a dementia diagnosis. Something that we're not very good at talking about vaginal dryness and loss of libido. Um, so really, really common symptoms. 
Um, I help run alongside Leslie, who will be doing the relaxation later. I help run a retreat, um, well, various kind of retreat sessions, days, weekends throughout the year. It's fabulous. Um, but uh, I, a couple of years ago, we'd done a, a, a women's circle, but it was quite a big women's circle the way that it had worked out. And we were talking about menopause and we were talking about well we were sort of talking about loss of libido me being a nurse I've got no um no filters when it comes to talking about the embarrassing things doesn't bother me in the least so it had sort of come up as part of this women's circle and I threw it out there I was like anybody you know anybody having problems sort of with their libido or their intimate health and no honestly all 30 ladies they were all at it like rabbits every single one of them and then we got to the coffee break and I tell you, every single one of them then came up to me and sort of said, oh, Tracy, I've got this problem. Is it normal? It doesn't seem to be normal. But by the time I sort of got to number 25, it's like, you know, ladies, we really need to be more open and, and honest about these things. Um, so vaginal dryness, loss of libido and water infections, they all go hand in hand, as does urinary incontinence and all of these things are often really really easy to treat and really really damaging if we don't know that we can treat those they can help damage relationships it can certainly ruin your confidence it can stop you doing various activities all sorts of things going on there that we just need to be really careful and mindful of that we can treat women often feel bloated we get digestive problems or digestive changes um, and something that women often notice is a change in the quality of their hair and their nails. And often they get brittle, flaking nails, much weaker than they used to be, or they find that their hair starts to fall out in clumps. And again, knowing whether this is because of some hormonal symptom or potentially other factors related to stress going on in their lives, we have to have the conversation and hone that down, but that can really happen. Sleep disturbances, often again linked to hot flushes and night sweats, but quite often we get to this sort of age, we forget how to relax, we can't get to sleep or we can get to sleep, but then two hours later, ping, we're wide awake and we don't know how to get back to sleep and it can be really, really challenging and that can have a massive impact on our productivity at work. Sleep is the foundation of getting everything else right. If we can crack that, most of the things will help fall into place, but the sleep disturbances is huge. Um, mood swings are really common. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever experienced the old meno rage, but it's something I come across very often. Um, and it is where you just really kind of struggle to manage your mood, to manage your emotions. And alongside of that, um, often my women, my, my women, my, my patients, my ladies that come into clinic, they may also be struggling with things like panic attacks, anxiety and depression. And again, as we go further on, I'll talk about really easy things that we can do to manage this that can have a knock on into the workplace, but not just that, that can really um, impact, be impactful in our personal lives as well. And there is very much a crossover here. So insomnia, again, really struggling to sleep, weight gain is extremely common, extremely common. And I have a little analogy further on that explains why this is the case, why we need to be more forgiving of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Headaches, again, very, very common symptom, muscle and joint pain. You know, people, I'm feeling my age, I ache all over, I'm getting old. Not always, not always. It can also be menopause and we need to ask the question. So, and that's just a handful of the symptoms. There are many, many more, but we'll move on a little bit. So three fundamental things, I call them menopause pillars, things that we can do. And none of these are rocket science, but this is where we as women can take back our power. It's okay going to the doctor or your menopause specialist or me, menopause specialist nurse, um, with all of your problems, but there is a certain amount that's within our own gift and we need to take control. And actually that can make us feel so much better in so many other ways as well. So good nutrition is really important. I know it's really common sense, but how many of us, when we get tired, when we get anxious, when we're feeling a little bit low and stressed, we're just 
nutrition would sort of take a bit of a backseat really because we maybe want the thing that's quick rather than the thing that would take a little bit more preparation but would actually be much better for us um, and learning how to balance our blood sugar levels again we'll talk about it a little bit further on that is absolutely key in 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 managing moods anxiety and all sorts of other things exercise is really important but it's not just it's not just exercise so exercise is key but we need to know what kind of exercise we're doing and when we are doing it because when we exercise we release cortisol which I'm going to talk about later as well um, and certain times of the day we really want to make sure our cortisol levels are low so doing high impact exercise on a night for example isn't a good idea however some exercise is always always better than no exercise so um, so it's there that we need to think about but we'll talk about it again a little bit further on and like I said sleep underpins everything if we can crack sleep and get that right then we are in a much stronger position to cope with everything else so promised we'd talk about supplements so lots of people like I said they want to use a more natural approach to their menopause which is very understandable and there are things that we can do um, to help support this so when we hit perimenopause and menopause the fundamental thing that's causing us a problem is that our estrogen levels are dropping and we can help prop that up a little bit so uh, there are plant substances with similar properties to the estrogen we have in our body and it's called phytoestrogens um, and we can find phytoestrogens um, in things like soya beans chickpeas beans peas um those kind of products and that you'd have to eat an awful lot to give you the amount of estrogen um that we are you know replacing uh, but but they can help prop that up a little bit there is also some research quite recent research out that says that these phytoestrogens are great at sort of scavenging um bad estrogen for want of a better way of putting it so for example people that have estrogen positive receptor breast cancer there is some evidence that that says people who have um a diet high in products containing phytoestrogens the phytoestrogens actually sort of scavenge the um the the, the cancer cells that are estrogen receptor positive and actually um sort of take those take those away really before they get chance to develop into fully blown breast cancer. Um, I, say, I, I can find you a reference. If anybody wants one, let me know. I will find you the references. Uh, I can't remember them off the top of my head, but there is, there is emerging research to say that that's actually, it's the really good things to have in our diet because of that. Whereas previously we thought that um, if people were maybe had breast cancer that, that was estrogen receptive positive obviously adding more estrogen into the diet could be a really bad thing and triggering but we're beginning to think that that's not the case um, and we know that women who eat the traditional Japanese diet which includes a lot of phytoestrogens they seem to have um, a reduced in incidence of things like hot flushes night sweats cardiac problems any problems with brittle bones and like I said, some cancers, and that's where we think the science falls in for that. Now, there are some popular uh, supplements. Um, I've got a list for you there, Black Coash, Jingsei, and all of the others on there. Uh, the thing with supplements is supplements are not backed by Big Pharma. So when we're talking about clinical trials, Big Pharma is going to, is where the money is and is where the big, reliable clinical trials are. You were not ever going to get that with supplements. So with supplements, we are largely relying on anecdotal evidence and some small scale studies. Um, so there are some out there. Um, but you've got to be really careful because there's also good research and bad research. And because there's no independent research around a lot of these things, what we find is the, the companies that produce the products are the ones that are then doing the research. And they're, of course, going to want to make it look like their products are effective, um, where in actual fact, we're not sure that that is the case. What I say to my patients is 
If that's the way you want to go, give it a try. But start with the things that we think are likely to be the most effective. So black cohosh, for example, is thought to be one of the more effective supplements, but we do need to be careful with supplements. So in the cases of breast cancer or liver disease, um, black cohosh is actually thought to enhance liver toxicity. Um, there are other supplements out there that can be quite damaging. Things like St. John's wort is a really toxic blood thinner. Um, so it can be really good for help lifting, lifting people's mood and improving um, symptoms of anxiety and depression if people find that it works for them. But we do need to be careful because of this, these interactions that they have. So it's not the case of just walking into your high street health food shop and everything in there being safe. We've really got to know what it is we're taking and why. Um, and, and so do your homework on that would be my best advice. So I'm going to explain the menopause um, in my little analogy that I have. I teach this to medical professionals as well as the general public. So if it's, if it's a bit basic, I do apologise, but it fits my tiny mind. So I'm going to take you pretending as if you were going back to school and we're going to be in a classroom. And in charge of the classroom is Mrs. Oxytocin. So if anybody's ever breastfed and had that letdown reflex, that is the release of oxytocin. Oxytocin is the love hormone. She is maternal, she is caring. Um, but most importantly, in this analogy, she's the boss and she's in charge and she is there in the biggest quantity. But in her classroom, she's got lots of little students. And these little students all have their own personalities. So in this case, the little students are all our different hormones. And I say it's a simplified version. There are other, other hormones at play. Um, but they've all got their own personalities to bring to the party. So let's take a look at those. So like I said, Mrs. Oxytocin, she's the feel good. She's the love hormone. She's what re gets released, like I said, during breastfeeding, but equally when we're in close contact with other people, um, when we are cuddling, when we're having sex, when we are having a laugh with the girls, any of those kind of things releases oxytocin. She's really important. We've got testosterone in there as well. And testosterone is a very important female hormone. In our childbearing years, testosterone is actually sometimes we end up with more of that circulating around us than the men do so for us it's really important and it's um, brilliant for energy focus concentration motivation and libido we've got leptin so leptin is our satiety hormone so leptin is the one that pipes up when we are full and tells us to stop eating We've got progesterone. So progesterone is largely responsible for our fertility, our ovulation, our menstruation. But for some women, progesterone is really vital for mood as well. And that's important. We've got estrogen. So she's also fertility hormone. But estrogen is the kid in the class that knows everything about everybody else. There's always one, isn't there? So estrogen lives in every single cell in your body. Estrogen particularly likes the fat cells. And that's important. I'll tell you for why later on. So we've got good cortisol. So, so we've, I'm splitting one hormone into two for the sake of this analogy, but we've got good cortisol. So this is our good stress hormone. This is the excited, I'm going on holiday, I'm going for a night out, I'm looking forward to something, I'm under a little bit of positive pressure, but it's all good, I'm feeling great, I'm feeling energized. This is good cortisol. We've got insulin. So insulin regulates our blood sugar levels, also critical. And ghrelin. Ghrelin is the hormone that makes us feel hungry. And then we've got bad cortisol, which is our stress hormone. Um, so they've all got their little personalities there. And while oxytocin in, is in charge, we've got harmony in the classroom. Remember, she's got the biggest influence. She's the boss. Bad cortisol, the stress hormone. We're going to think of this one as the naughty kid in the class. And while bad cortisol is sitting next to Mrs. Oxytocin and she's got her eye on them, no problems at all. Everything's under control. 
Our digestive hormones, leptin and ghrelin, our hunger and satiety hormones, they're playing out on the seesaw and keeping the balance there is insulin. Oestrogen and progesterone, so they're the two BFFs at school. They're going to hang out together all the time and they're, they're never one seen without the other. And then we've got testosterone. So testosterone is the kid that everybody loves to hate, you know, excels on the sports field, excels academically, lots of energy, lots of um, popularity, uh, lots of motivation and the good cortisol as well. The cheeky little chap there, uh, keeping us motivated, excited, life's good. But what happens in perimenopause and menopause is these kids start to become teenagers. We all know what teenagers are like, I suspect. So the influence of oxytocin becomes quite a lot smaller in the classroom. Oestrogen and progesterone, so they become quite flighty. Oestrogen, you never know what she's going to do from one day to the next, one second to the next. Sometimes she's going to turn up for school. Sometimes she's not going to bother. Sometimes she's going to storm out. Sometimes she might storm in. God knows what's going on with her. Completely unpredictable. Progesterone, she's on a little bit more of a trajectory, but it's a downward trajectory in so much as she's losing interest. And, you know, eventually she'll just sh stop showing up to school altogether. We've got the digestive hormones playing out on this seesaw and insulin there trying to keep the balance. And the problem is in perimenopause and menopause, that becomes really, really difficult for insulin. So insulin needs to grow extra muscles and get a bit bigger to try and keep that balance. And quite often what can happen is if insulin is overworked, if insulin has to give too much of themselves, they throw their hands up in horror and says, oh, that's it, I'm all done, I'm out of here, I can't do this anymore. And that's when we're stepping into the territory of type two diabetes. So getting insulin to work for us is really important. And if you've ever heard the term insulin resistance, that's what this is. We become resistant to the power of insulin. We need to produce more and more of it to get the same sort of effect. Um, and that, that isn't always a good thing. So testosterone and good cortisol, their influence in the classroom has become a whole lot smaller uh, once they hit puberty or teenagerdom. And bad cortisol, well, bad cortisol, because Mrs. Oxytocin is now very little, very little influence, they've been given, given free reign. And what happens if you've got an overload of bad cortisol, just like the naughty kid in the classroom, if the, if the naughty kid in the classroom is given free reign, nobody else can do any work and it will disrupt all of the other hormones there. So that's what happens in our menopausal years. And if we want to look that, at that in a far more sensible way, here it is. So essentially this little chart here is um, our hormonal teenage estrogen and progesterone. Um, we need all of these hormones to work well together, but when cortisol is allowed to have free reign, no, it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna work. And never are we more stressed than when we are juggling um, a home and a family and a responsible job or you know maybe several jobs all sorts of other stresses going on maybe aging parents and um, maybe being a carer for relatives partners whatever um, th there can be a lot going on there so we need to get in charge of our stress so like I sort of said, kind of labour in the point, but we need to put oxytocin back in charge of the classroom. Um, if we put oxytocin back in charge, then, then everything else stands a fighting chance. I'm not going to say it'll be perfect because it won't be, but if oxytocin is, has the biggest influence, then we've got more, we're better equipped to then manage the other issues that we've got going on. So self-care seems to be quite a trendy um, phrase at the moment. Everybody's talking about self-care. For ladies of this age, whether it's, it's yourself, whether it's a relative, a colleague, whatever, self-care is not a luxury, it's essential. And if we want to have good working relationships, if we want to optimize our colleagues' productivity, if we want to be supportive, 
if we want other people to look after us, then we actually need to prioritise our self-care. And there are lots of activities that we can do that will help with that. Like I mentioned earlier, high impact exercise actually creates more cortisol. So while I would always say exercise overall is great for you, and I like to run. Um, so, uh, so I get it completely. I'm not very good at relaxing, but going for a run on a night would be a bad thing because that's going to raise our cortisol levels at a time when we really need them to be low in order to optimize our sleep. So if we can sort of shift um, high impact exercise to earlier in the day, that's a really good idea. If we can't, we can buffer our cortisol output with things like oxytocin inducing activities. So yoga, not the kind where you're sticking your leg behind your ear. <laughs> Restorative specialist menopause yoga, the kind that, that my colleague Leslie does is really good. The restorative yoga helps deliberately bring down the activity of the central nervous system. And that's what raising oxytocin levels is all about. Anything that you can find to help you relax or to help people around you relax is a good thing. But I say for me, um, if I'm feeling particularly stressed, I'll stick on my running shoes and go out for a run, which can help me relax me in one way. But if then I'm wanting to go to sleep in the next breath, I'm going to be at cross purposes. So it needs to be the right kind of relaxation. I'd probably be better off going out for a walk and just keeping things just that slightly lower impact. Exercise, any exercise is really important. Um, as I say, we know we can buffer it. Good nutrition, absolutely vital. We know now, don't we, that our digestive hormones are on this seesaw. And we know that insulin is trying to work really, really hard, particularly at this stage in our life to keep everything balanced. So if we want to prop that up a little bit, we need to be aware of um, keeping our sugar intakes low and when i'm talking about sugar i'm talking about um obviously the white stuff so cakes biscuits sweets anything like that but i'm also talking about refined carbohydrates so refined carbohydrates will cause us to have a massive surge in ins insulin which will cause insulin to have to work harder so there i'm talking about things like pasta rice anything at all with wheat flour in it will all spike our blood sugar levels and cause problems with our insulin. So minimizing our intake of those is a really good idea. Um, in the workplace, I would always advise with my workplace sessions, look at what's going on in the canteen. You know, at this stage, your female employees that are maybe going through perimenopause, menopause, they might just not have the brain capacity or the time or the energy to pack a nutritious lunch. What can they get from the staff canteen if there is one? Do we need to be looking at that? Because if it's all everything with chips and rice and pasta, that's not going to be doing them any favours. And actually, come the afternoon, they're going to have uh, an insulin surge followed by a blood sugar slump, and they're going to be feeling even more fatigued, and they're going to be struggling more with their memory and more with the brain fog and more with their energy. And can we put things within... Uh, you know, is it within the gift of the employer to look at what is available to the staff and provide things that actually support proper nutrition? Underpinning, like I've said, everything is good sleep. So trying to build in a good sleep regime is, is really important. And much like we do with babies, we give them a nighttime routine, don't we? You know, often it's bath, um, reading, it's bath story and bed. And actually we respond to that in a similar kind of way, if we make it a habit. Because if it's a long-term habit, our, our brain sort of almost anticipates what's coming next and then starts to produce adenosine, which is our sleep hormone, um, and helps us to settle down a little bit better. So having that good sleep routine is really important. And then doing what brings you joy. And I don't think we do this enough, certainly at certain stages of our, our life, we're so busy keeping all the balls in the air and making sure that everybody else is all right, that often we forget to do what actually brings us joy. So if that is having some time alone, do that. If you are a social animal and you need that in order to, to make you up, to lift your mood, 
do that. Do what brings you joy. Find things that make you laugh. And if it's in the workplace environment, again, we need to be looking at where we can find that lightness, where we can find that fun. Where can we where can we give people a little bit of a break from the full on pressure? And that's a really, really difficult thing to do. But if we want to get the best out of people, it's really important to give them that to hold that space for them. So we've sort of covered this a little bit, but cortisol and sleep is really important. If we've got high, high stress levels, be it we've just, you know, just been done for done around in the gym, or we've just had a row with the partner, or the kids aren't behaving, or work's overwhelming, or anything like that, we're not going to sleep well, are we? We know that it's common sense. So it's very much about developing calming and relaxing techniques. To, to sort of disperse that stress and often picking our battles. You know, do we really need to have the argument with the teenager about the bedroom at eight o'clock at night? Is it that important? Uh, or can we let that go and, and, you know, worry about it some other time? Uh, making those pragmatic decisions, I think, is, um, is, is Really important to mention, because I think sometimes, particularly at this age and when we're people that are juggling so much, we can hold on to the wrong things uh, or hold on to everything more to the point and, and kind of forget to filter uh, the does it matter? Is it a battle I want to have today kind of question? Right. And then therapy. So we've covered some of this already, but popular therapies for menopause manage management are yoga but again I would stress the restorative yoga the, and that there is specialist menopause yoga um, that, that you do get you know people are specially qualified in that to teach which is all about bringing down the activity of the central nervous system. Acupuncture I think is a brilliant one for women who actually really struggle to relax um, and again, this is something that people could potentially bring into the workplace, not randomly, somebody qualified. <laughs> but but if, if you've got, you know, if you, if you want to bring therapies into your workplace to support the workforce, things like yoga and acupuncture are really effective things to do. And acupuncture is particularly good for women like me who don't know how to relax because this is a done to you therapy rather than a done by you therapy. So I'm a bit rubbish at yoga. I'll be honest, I will try it but I'll be there thinking right okay so I'm mentally making the shopping list I'm thinking about all the jobs I need to do all of these kind of things going on I really struggle uh, whereas acupuncture it's somebody doing something to you which actually then induces that relaxation which is something that I find a little bit easier to manage Cognitive behavioural therapy and I assume probably in this group of people are very familiar with CBT um, but it's actually got a huge research backing for people going through the perimenopause and menopause, particularly when it comes to sleep issues. And all the research base, uh, all the research that we have, the evidence that we have around this shows that, and I'm sure, I'm sure it translates across all of the areas, is that it's actually more effective as an intervention than medication for supporting sleep disturbances particularly during the perimenopausal and menopausal years. Uh, reflexology is an excellent one. Um, so that is the, the, the foot massage. Again, the evidence behind it isn't particularly great, but some people find it really, really useful. And if it helps you relax, fantastic. Similar with homeopathy, magnetism. I wonder if anybody's had the magnets in their knickers job. Uh, you can actually, it, it, it may just be a UK thing, but, but you can buy these magnets that, that women um, tip on either side of the knickers. Some women swear by it. Um, I can't say it's, it's something that's ever appealed to me, but for some ladies, they find it really useful. But overall, we are looking to, re to, to improve the health and well-being, reduce our stress levels and improve sleep. And if we can do that, we are foundationally getting there. Um, stimulants. So stimulants are a really important thing and uh, it wouldn't be a good presentation unless I mentioned those. So stimulants and depressants, they can really magnify our moods, particularly when we hit our perimenopausal and menopausal years. So sugar, I've just explained how insulin is working so much harder uh, and 
struggling to keep that balance. So sugar is going to be a massive stimulant, but it also gives us a massive low as well. Um, and then you can't really sustain that high without, you know, going on a bit of a sugar bender and nobody thinks that that's really a good idea, I don't think. Minimising caffeine, and if, if people are drinking a lot of caffeine or even not such a lot, I would always recommend doing this very, very slowly. Caffeine is a huge stimulant. The number one symptom women come to me with in my menopause clinics is anxiety from the menopause. And one of the things that I do straight away is encourage them to reduce their caffeine intake. And so many women will say to me, I only have a couple of cups and it's all before two o'clock in the afternoon. Well, I used to have one cup of caffeinated coffee a day. And it was usually about 6.30 in the morning when I went on for the beginning of an NHS uh, shift. So I'd have my cup of coffee, one cup of caffeinated coffee, coffee, and that was it. And then one year, along came Lent, and I decided, well, for the period of Lent, I'm going to give up caffeine. So I just stopped. And I withdrew for a fortnight. I was really poorly. I wasn't well at all. Massive, horrific, awful headaches, nausea, really, really nasty. So I would always say, I mean, I know I've had my um, nutrigenetics done. I know I'm particularly sensitive to caffeine, um, but I didn't know that at the time. But um, I would always say reduce slowly. Um, I've had patients come in uh, to see me in clinic and have actually had like a, a reasonably recent admission to hospital that people thought they were having a stroke and things like that. And when we actually looked back, they'd been to the GP the week before and the GP had told them to give up caffeine. So they had. Um, and then they'd ended up hospitalised because of crushing headaches um, and so people thinking that they were having a stroke. It's a really addictive drug. It's probably the most addictive drug in society. Uh, and it's a stimulant. It can make us feel super anxious. Reducing that can have such a positive effect. And obviously other stimulants and depressants, which do it with alcohol. So it does both, doesn't it? It's a stimulant initially and then it's a depressant. And it's something that I see a lot of women using as a bit of a crutch. And uh, throughout their perimenopausal and menopausal years. And um, really, if we can just reduce it, it will really, really help. So I'm just going to quickly go through uh, the difference in different kinds of HRT. I'm a huge fan of HRT. HRT protects our brains, protects us, doesn't protect us. It reduces the risk of us getting things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. It protects our bones from things like osteoporosis, and it helps protect us from cardiac disease as well. But there are different kinds of HRT. Um, so traditional HRT in that column, what I'm meaning by that is the kind of HRT that we can buy, not that we can buy, that we can get prescribed and go and collect on the high street. And generally speaking, these days, that's called body identical HRT. So it consists of either gels, patches or sprays and often a tablet type of progesterone. This medication is regulated. It's produced in regulated pharmacies. There are clinical trials on it. We know the risks and the side effects. It's governed by the MHRA and we know it's really, really effective. So this is the stuff that I prescribed. It's naturally made. It's uh, made from yams. You'd have to eat an awful lot of yams, though, to get enough. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend that. But it's made from yams and um, it's called body identical because it's as near to our own biology as we can get. Then we've got compounded or bioidentical HRT. Now, this can also be really good. And we know that it can be effective for symptom management. It also helps, excuse me, protect our bones and our hearts. The problem with it is, and the reason that I don't prescribe it, is that it's not regulated. So it's produced in compounding pharmacies, which can be really, really good, but they're not regulated. There aren't the clinical trials around it. So being able to um, advocate it is a difficult thing to do. But for some women that have maybe tried the body identical HRT, if they've found that they can't find a a, a, a way that works for them with the, with the more traditional body identical HRT, they have sometimes found success with the compounded um, the compounded fat pharmacy version. Uh, but so it's not not one I recommend particularly because it isn't regulated. And if it's not regulated, 
it's, it's not got the same stringent controls. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not going to be regulated in the future. And if that's the case, I might be all over it then. Uh, so just in conclusion, menopause isn't something we can manage with one tool in the box alone. It needs a full multimodal approach. HRT is not a magic wand, but can really, really help. But we also need to take control of our own health. Um, take responsibility for what's within our own gift and look at our stress level, nutrition, sleep, all of those kind of things. Um, I run the Menopause Advocates um, Service. So this is a way that people can work with me specifically in more detail within the workplace. Um, and we train people up to be menopause advocates in the workplace. So a lot more in-depth training than we've covered today. Um, but that helps people support other people in the workplace. And those are the references that I've used today. And if have we got time, Julie, for um, just a, a five five minute or so relaxation? Yes, yeah, sure. We've got ten minutes left, so yeah, no problem yeah, at all. No, I mean right. this was this was fantastic. I mean it was really uh, yeah a lot of eye opening. But so okay, you were saying no rice, no pasta, or to limit rice, pasta, limit and all wheat products. So what's basically left? So there's no no bread, no. I mean I thought rice was okay. You see, I was being I was I was a rice girl. The, well, the, the, it, it, it's not terrible. Um, it, it's the refined part that's the problem. So once you get your white rice, basically all of the whole whole wheat part of it has been removed. So it hits our body just as pure starch and our body can just right. really quickly convert it to sugars. If we're going to go for those other options, then try and go for the more whole wheat, whole grain varieties. Okay. So that so that basically half the job of digestion hasn't already been done for us. Do you see what I mean? The other yeah. thing that we can do is if if I mean, I'm not saying don't have the carbs, limit the portions. And I would always advocate eating some protein or fat part of your meal first because that will actually then buffer the effects that it has on the insulin. If you go straight in with the starches, your insulin is going to rock it. Whereas if uh -huh. you go in with the protein and the fats, it just gives it a little bit of a buffer and helps things stay a bit more level. Fantastic. I mean, this has been extremely thorough. Uh, I thought that the way you presented it with the, the classroom was very, very clever. I mean, I've been trying to write down for years, okay, this and that and this, but I mean, suddenly now I see it, right? I see yeah. it and I will not forget. So thank you very much for all of that. And I'm sure that will be a great help to everyone, whether, as you say, it's in the workplace or just in our own workplace for those of us who are entrepreneurs. And it's great that it's also being talked about as in, in the workplace. I know in, in Holland, for example, it's now very much, there's very much a movement um, towards that. And also the idea, I don't know what you think of it, that very many burnouts yes. have been misdiagnosed because it is actually symptoms of the menopause. It is, we're seeing 10% of our female employees leaving over the age of 45 because of menopause symptoms. Um, and that's a shocking amount, really, of really experienced staff um, that, that are just, just leaving because they either don't feel supported or they don't feel that they can cope or that the services aren't there to, to, to prop them up. Right, which is which is pretty horrible when you think of it. You know, we're the ones creating the children, thanks to all of our hormones. Uh, yeah. And what goes up has to come down at some point. And just as much as we may be given, not special treatment, but people will be aware of our circumstances when we're working in a corporate and pregnant, this should also be in the same boat, right? Because you can't Absolutely. have the procreation without the rest. So yeah. uh, I'm glad for people like you who are doing that work. And one other question that I have just because I'm based in the Netherlands is your advocates program. Is that online as well or only face to face? No, it is online. So it's actually accessible to anybody. Um, okay. Clinic wise, obviously, my specialist clinics are only available to people in um, in the UK. Uh, they can be done remotely. Um, but but the advocacy service, it, it can be done remotely, but only in the UK because I'm a UK registered nurse. Yes. Uh, whereas um, the advocacy programme is available to anybody. Perfect. Thank you. Lovely. Right. Shall I press play yes. let's, and let us do it? It's, it's just a, a, a five minute breathing exercise more than anything. But we've talked so myself. much about. Yes. So much about how stress 
needs to be reduced. So, um, so I will pop Leslie on. And hopefully this is a short visualization technique called the belly breathing for relaxation. As we've discovered, whenever the mind or the body are feeling overwhelmed, our breathing rate will increase. This is in order to supply our muscles with extra oxygen in order to run away or fight back. This is a part of the flight or fight response. When we begin to relax, we find that the breathing slows down. And when the breathing slows down, then the mind begins to become clearer too. This is a part of the relaxation response. We're very fortunate to have a very simple breathing technique that can be practiced anywhere, anytime, and will help to induce the relaxation response and all the health benefits associated with it. I invite you now to find a comfortable lying or supported seating position. And sure you'll not be disturbed for the next five minutes or so. Rest your hands over your belly button. Close your eyes. And sit quietly. Let your face soften. Relax your shoulders. Feel your body melting into your chair or the floor. Feel the warmth of your hands against your belly. Begin to notice your breathing. Focusing at the nostrils. Feel the breath pass down your windpipe into your lungs, to your belly. Feel a very gentle and natural rise of your belly as you breathe in. And the softening of your belly as you breathe out. No need to do anything else. Just feel your body breathe in itself. Don't try changing your breathing. Simply listen and watch it. Notice how each breath is unique. Notice any sounds that your body makes as you breathe. Notice which is longer, the in or the out breath. Begin to silently repeat the word peace as you breathe in. Feel that your mind and body are becoming more peaceful with each breath. You could 
replace the word with something such as calm, love, forgiveness. Often the mind is wandering elsewhere. Don't judge yourself when this happens. But simply accept that your mind has wandered and gently guide it back to your breath. When you feel ready, release the practice. And spend a few moments listening to the sound of your body. Notice how you feel. Hear the sound around you. And gently stretch. Ready to go about your business, feeling a little more rested and refreshed. It's a good idea to practice this technique three or four times during the day when you're not feeling stressed. For example, when you get out of bed, after your lunch, after your evening meal, and as you get back into bed at night. Once your mind and body connect with this quiet breathing and that sense of calm, you'll begin to be able to calm yourself very easily with it when things are rough. By practicing a few times a day, you're building up to giving yourself 20 minutes of restorative relaxation every day. Wonderful. What a gift. Oh, I, I could really feel it, even though I was conscious that everybody's looking at me out there. I could really feel it. That's a lovely yeah. gift. And it just yeah. sounds so simple, but I think I should record her saying it like that. You just do it again and again and again. You know, thank you very, very much for this, Tracy. It was, um, you know, I think it is for everyone. As you say, it's for the women who are listening to this. So do take note of what Tracy's been telling us. But also, as you say, for those who are not in the perimenopause or menopause, for, for the women around us, who we may be misjudging, you know, symptoms about tiredness or rattiness or whatsoever. And just as much as we were maybe patient or more patient than usual with our adolescents when they were also being run by all of these changes in hormones, I think we also deserve to be more patient and understanding to the women around us, including ourselves, who are going through this because it's a fact we're going through it. It's not some figment of our imagination. So Tracy, thank you for people like you who dedicate their careers to doing uh, this and as you say it should be talked about and in all aspects as you say yeah. in particular those that people don't talk about and then worry whether it's wrong or if there's something wrong with their relationship or whatsoever yeah. so thank you very very much I hope to welcome you back and for the rest of you out there make your notes in your CPR pads and you know let's let's embrace this and, and make these the good years of our life as well very much Wonderful. Lovely having Thank you all here. Bye-bye. Bye, Tracy. Thank you. Bye.